Welcome into the KSO Sunday show. Mason Both, KSU underscore fan, Drew Galloway here with you. Drew feeling festive on this Super Bowl Sunday. So <laughs> hopefully for those of you watching, it it comes probably either before the Chiefs win or certainly after. I mean, Drew looks like a fool if the Chiefs lose and you're watching this on Monday. So uh, I hope for everybody's sake that the Chiefs win uh, today. We are here with, uh, you know, more K-State talk. The Cats a little bit back on track. They got a good win on Monday night, and they tried to get a miraculous win on on Saturday evening very late that I think most people would think, nah, only K-State blows games like that. Uh, and, and you may ultimately be right since K-State didn't finish the job and, and officially come back against BYU. But a lot to get to with how this team is playing and kind of the outlook for things moving forward because – this is you you have more than half of your games in Big 12 play gone at this point. So the margin for error, it was already small for K State. It's only going to get smaller. And you buy yourself some time if you can go out and win a road game against a team that you probably didn't think you'd get it against. And last night, even though they played poorly in the middle part of it, they had a chance at the end. They weren't able to to overcome it. And really it it was like a lot of things with this team, they're just not good enough to mask their deficiencies for a full 40 minutes. And if they are, um, they've they've probably picked picked up the pieces elsewhere. They just couldn't do it last night. So a lot to get into. Uh, we'll start with general thoughts from Fan and Drew, though. So I'll let Drew lead off. K-State, one in one week. What does it mean to you about this team? I, I, I think to me it just means that they're treading water. Like they, they, they did what they were supposed to do this week and beat KU. And if you want to make the tournament, that's a game that you got to have. And then played pretty poorly for most of the game uh, last night against BYU and lost. And the BYU loss isn't the end of the world. But what was concerning to me was the lack of focus seemed to be there again, which seems to be a, a growing problem. And then the other thing that was concerning to me was BYU <laughs> as a team that loves to foul and doesn't get to the foul line and case they couldn't get to the foul line and kept fouling. So that that part was concerning because that that was an area where I expected Casey to kind of dominate. I mean BYU's had multiple games where they haven't even shot 10 free throws in a game. So it, it was just a frustrating aspect uh, of the game last night with that. Yeah, I, I would just to go back to the week. It's it's <clears throat> there's some encouragement for me just because you had the week you you expected to have. You know, we had uh, the week where we didn't expect to have against Oklahoma schools, which may be the one that really comes back to bite this team in the end. But to to recover and get that win against KU. Um, and to get a quad one win, uh, a win from one of the top five teams in the league, um, the team that's probably going to end up in the top 10, top 15 of the, in a, of the net by the end of the season, that's a, a, a win you can hang your hat on a little bit. Um, I did not expect us to win yesterday. It's not doesn't make watching that game any less frustrating. Mm -hmm. But it, the game went exactly, or not exactly, but pretty much what I thought would happen. You know, I, you know the trend continues. BYU did not shoot great from three, but they still outshot K-State, and they have won every game they've done that this season against every opponent they've played. So uh, we have that issue. We have no surprise K-State uh, turns the ball over too much, and we did that again. And, you know, I was just looking at the trends. Um, at, at this point, none of this has become a surprise because this is what this team has become. Um, the last eight games, um, they have averaged – 0.77 points per possession in the first half and have no game above 0.89 points per possession in the first half in the last eight. And they've still managed to win a couple of those uh, against good teams, but there's some sort of systematic problem with the offense um, going into games. And I don't know if it's player or, or game plan oriented, or maybe a mix of both. Uh, but it's not a surprise when you shoot that poorly in the first half, when you have nine turnovers per game in the first half, when you get beat on the offensive glass by three 
in the first half every game for the last eight games, those are the things that really have got to be corrected. And that's why this team's where it's at. And that's why this team lost the game to Oklahoma State, which is a game that you look, we're going to look back and say that was the bad loss. We're going to look yeah. back at getting killed at Oklahoma. I'm not going to look it back at this BYU game and, and, and it's going to be a heartbreaker because even though they did come back and catch two, like tons of credit and we can rehash the late game situation. Uh, but Jerome Tang has said it well. You went on the road by building a 10 point lead in the second half and reducing your margin for error. When you have to come back every game in the second half, to win, that's when you make it tough. And that's where, <laughs> again, another game we'll regret is you have an eight-point lead under four minutes at Texas Tech and you lose the game. That's the one you shouldn't lose. So um, I don't begrudge. It was frustrating because part of it, it's 9 o'clock and we're all tired and <laughs> over 11. Uh, that's part of it. But it's frustrating to watch. But, again, it's just something we've seen. And it's not going to be one that I look back and say, man, that sucked. There's a lot more of those games, and it won't even be in my top five. Yeah, I think uh, I, that's probably a good way to put it. And like, ultimately, even the outcomes, you know, at, at Texas Tech and at BYU, you look and you say, "Oh, you lost a road game close, like <laughs> strong performance, whatever." Um, it's it's that Oklahoma State game is you, like that's just unforgivable. Like, I get it, whatever. Yeah. But the only way Oklahoma State was going to win that game was if they played against no defense and that's what K-State basically allowed them to do. And the Oklahoma, the Oklahoma home game, honestly, to me is probably more inexcusable than the loss at Oklahoma state. At least you were on the road. That team shot. Well, they played well that day, Oklahoma state outside of their game against KU, every single game they've played at home this year, even the losses has been decided by five points or less in big 12 play. So they took Baylor to overtime. They played TCU tight and had a big lead. Like they have been a tougher team mm -hmm. at home, but in this league, the way that you make your hay is by taking care of business at home. And I, I drew and I talked about it last night and I referenced the Pat 40 story that he did about mm -hmm. the big 12 and where the national average is like home teams win like 56% of their games. In the Big 12 this year, it's over 64%. The home team is winning. And that's because the teams are better and, and the fans are more into it. Like, you have the perfect storm there. And K-State, even if they lose a home game, I don't know that there's any team in this league that they should lose by 20 at home to, and certainly not the Oklahoma team that they saw. Um, and that just, you know, it goes to show what this team is. They are They are the true definition of an NIT team. They are good enough to beat good teams on any given night, but they're not good enough to avoid playing so bad that they can lose to anybody and put up a putrid performance that makes you reconsider thinking that any of them have basketball talent. Uh, that's just what NIT teams do. I mean, mm -hmm. I we people watch Seth Greenberg on ESPN every day. That man lived off of NIT teams at Virginia Tech. <laughs> uh, like, and I like I don't think that's going to be the long term thing for K State basketball, but. Given the situation that this team has gone through, they do play a lot more like that this year, and they're going to have to to start playing in a way that kind of flips that script and gets people thinking differently. Because right now you have four home games remaining in conference play. You absolutely have to win all four of those to feel like you have a chance. But they're also still going to be fighting. Now, if you get those wins, you're probably in a better spot. But they're going to be fighting where they are in the metrics because they're – they did move up to 76 from 78 after the loss last night, but nobody outside of the top 80 has ever made it into the NCAA tournament since they started using the net. That is of at large teams, obviously the, you know, in majors or whatever that are AQ schools. So the K state's got it stacked up against them. I, I, th I think this team can play basketball good enough to win any game left on their schedule. I'm just not confident that they're consistent enough or good enough to actually make that happen. I think that the consistency again, goes back to just the focus. Like it, it there were a lot of times last night where, I mean, I, I was texting some people during the game and I said that there are multiple players that again, don't look like they want to be on a basketball court. And, and that that's the thing about this team that is frustrating as all get out is 
the the two things that you can really control are your attitude and your effort and you don't get a consistent attitude or effort from this team and that that that's the thing when you're 24 games in that's what makes you an NIT team is you don't play consistent basketball well, yeah. I, I wonder sometimes what's going through Cam Carter's head on some of the turnovers he commits because, like, the guy's going to touch the ball more than a lot of other guys, so the turnovers are going to be high. The thing is, is you watch him, it's not like he's turning the ball over because he's trying to make plays or make passes to guys. It's the ball's just bouncing off of his hand out of bounds, or it, it's it's a lack of focus, like what you're talking about, Drew. Yeah, I, I think there's – a little bit of a nature with some of the guys that they get a little bit nonchalant with, especially on the offensive end. And, and I don't know if it's because of the energy put on the defensive end. I don't know if it's because of the freedom they're allowed on the offensive end. And <clears throat> there's that also that point where, you know, being two scholarship players down, there's less options. So, you know, <laughs> Unfortunately, you know you can make a mistake if you're one of the older players and you're probably not coming out of the game because there's no one else coming in that's going to do better than you. And, you know, that's just kind of the hand we've been dealt with, you know, not having two scholarship players that were probably counted on to be in the top eight of the rotation minimum. That that really not only hurts your production, but it reduces your margin for error with those kind of guys. And just, just something to – you know, we, you're talking about being hurt in the metrics. And, you know, I just I was looking back, just watching the trend line for, for what we've seen. The two home losses really have been killers. Um, they dropped 18 spots, 19 spots after losing to Nebraska in the net, and they lo- dropped eight spots after losing to Oklahoma. So that's 25 spots. Really, if you probably win those two games, you probably stay about the same. Maybe you drop a spot because it's a close game at home. But those home losses have probably cost K-State 25 spots in the net at least. And then I think we can probably look back. We started the first net. When the first net came out, K-State was 100 in the net, mainly because of those two losses to Miami and USC, who have turned out to be not very good teams. USC especially is just a bad team at this point. Um, so those probably dropped you another 20 spots, those two losses. And then your close games to Bellarmine and – some of those didn't help you either. So K-State has not helped themselves. I mean, I, I know we can look at the net and break it down and compare teams, but if we're, if you know, at some point you got to reach a point and you're honest and you're like, we kind of earned being number 76 yep. in the net based on how we've played, mm-hmm. uh, even with some really good wins. But well, like and- you said, that's what NIT teams do. And, and that's that's what like the other day I was going through and I was trying to look and and see at the teams that are there directly ahead of K State and like okay who of these teams do I think K State is better than like now you can you can like K State's better than McNeese K State is better than Richmond K State is better than St Bonaventure they're they're better than these schools I'm not going to say UC Irvine because we know uh, that that hasn't been true within the last five years um, but like. I, I genuinely can't say. I mean, the way they're playing right now, I think UCF's a better basketball team than K-State. Uh, I mean, at their peaks, I'm, I would probably be more fearful of playing K-State. But knowing what we know with consistency, UCF has played like maybe the more consistent team lately. Uh, and I like I try to poke holes in other teams. Like I was trying to make fun of Pitt being 59 in the net the other day. I can't do it like. Pitt has turned it on a little bit. They're playing better, and I cannot say mm-hmm. with certainty that K-State is better than them. So I think you're absolutely right. K-State has earned where they're at in the net, and I, I, I say this a lot, but bad teams, they lose games. And while K-State is not a horrible team, they are not a very good team, and they're proving that by losing some of the games and how they're doing it. Uh, and they're, they're probably just going to find themselves on the wrong side of this. And I really am like – they probably, if as long as they don't like completely fall apart, this probably is an NIT team. But as we talked about, like the way it's set up now, the top two non NCAA tournament teams in the net, they get automatic bids from the the Power Six conferences into the NIT. Mm-hmm. K State would currently not qualify for that because Cincinnati and UCF are better than K State in the net. Like there is a real world where K State's not even playing in the NIT this year, and like. It, 
I think this team would probably should probably feel a little bit embarrassed if they don't make it in the NCAA tournament because even with all the stuff that they've endured, I think they are still there's still enough talent there. But so many of the mental things and non physical traits that go with basketball, this team has been bad at this year. And so, yeah, it would it would be a, a mark on them to not play in the NCAA tournament. But this team, if they don't turn it on and they're they're not in the NIT. They should feel really embarrassed about that because the collection of talent that is still on this team is not bad enough to not play in postseason. That is true, and we've seen that multiple times. I mean, Jerome Tang said it after the KU game where this team told on themselves, now they got to go out and prove it the rest of the way, and they tried to for five minutes in Provo last night, but they spent about 30 minutes last night looking like a team that didn't belong in the NCAA or NIT. Well, the, the other issue, too, is like they're not a bad enough team to get blown out by Nebraska, who's only won one road game all year and has only really been competitive in the yeah. in the K-State game on the road this yeah. season. And they're definitely not bad enough to get beat by 20 to that Oklahoma team that I still don't think is very good. So that that's the issue when you look at this team as a whole of, Okay, losing at home is bad, but getting blown out by both of those two teams is even worse. And it it's just a consistency and effort and focus thing. And the biggest issue for me in that is that this team is not a good offensive team. But what bothers me is that when the shots aren't falling, that's when you really see the lack of focus and everything. But they're not a good enough offensive team to not like to be frustrated with how they're playing on offense because it's just the new, it's the normal for this team. So I, I don't understand the, the lack of focus after a missed shot because it's not like you've been torching the nets all season. Yeah. It's, it's, <clears throat> it's frustrating to see the, the breakdowns on, uh, on offense, especially, um, there was stretches, you know. I I thought the, the the weird thing is is I I do think outside of that second half against Oklahoma State, this team has been pretty consistently giving good effort on defense. Like it does it does take effort to. I mean, that we are K State's currently the second best efficiency defense in Big Twelve play in Big Twelve games. So they've done well there, but they're eleventh on offense in the the bottom four teams with them are all brutally bad at 0.98 or below. Uh, so it's hard to make up for that. And, and I always have said um, eventually bad offense leads to lapses in defense, even when you're playing hard. And I think we've seen that with this team. I think we saw that a couple of times in the second half, even while they made the run against BYU. So um, you just, you can't do that. I mean, that, and again, we talked about that's what NIT teams look like. You know, we saw Bruce's bubble team in 2017 was like this. Frank's second team with Jacob Pullen and Denny Clemente was like this. Even Bob Huggins' team was like this. And I go back to even – I'm old enough to remember Asbury's 98-99 teams was like this. And even Jim Woolridge's NIT bubble team is what I call it. In, <laughs> in, 20, in 2005 – was worse than this, but the, the traits are similar. You, you just yeah. lose a lot of games. You shouldn't. And as the season goes along, you talk about when you lost, lose those games in the first third of big 12 play, man, that reduces the margin for error. And then that margin for error just keeps shrinking and shrinking and shrinking. And then you're in do or die and you've got to pretty much win the big 12 tournament to get in. I don't know if this team will quite get to that point. They might, but every time they lose one of these close games, the margin for error shrinks and and now you have to win every road home game for sure. And then you probably do need to steal one on the road or win the first round big 12 tournament game to even have a shot. Yeah. It's, it's going to be, it's going to be tough for them to, to find a way to, to get in now. Cause like, I, I wish, you know, it'd be nice if there was uh kind of like uh, when I was going to K state and I'm and like, they still do where you can pop in the what if grades, uh, <laughs> If the NCAA wanted to invest into what if grades for uh, the net, I would I would be interested in, in seeing that because I think that'd be a helpful tool and it'd get a lot of usage. Um, but even with what K State 
has left. Let's say that they finish out and they go four and three and they win the four home games. Uh, is is that enough to get them into the NCAA tournament? You get two quad one wins out of it and you would get a quad three and a quad two win. And then you'd have obviously a bevy of, of quad one losses in there. So it, w- do we think that would be enough to get K-State in? Because it does feel like this is trending to where even a nine and nine Big 12 K-State team could get left on the cutting room floor. And even a month ago, I didn't think that no matter the combination of wins, because I thought that they would have enough juice. But I think this team, the way they've played, has given them some bad PR in the basketball world. Uh, yeah, I I go back and forth on that because I I I, I think 99 would be really bubble bubble territory um, because you would have a couple, you know, that would the committee would consider bad losses. But then on the other hand, you're probably, you know, because even though they don't talk about it a lot, it kind of comes up in these conversations that there's kind of a quad 1A and a quad 1B. And in that scenario, K-State would have three probably quad 1A wins over KU, BYU, or Baylor and Iowa State. And not a lot of teams are going to have that uh, in the same bubble conversation as k-state but then they're they were, but then on the other hand they'd have the brutal road record as well which they do like to see that if a team can win on the road and their neutral court record is not good this year either so um there's some knocks definitely would be against k-state it'd be one of those selection sundays where i could see it going either way if they don't get that one more quad one type win and the, th- the funny thing is in the first round of the Big 12 tournament, K-State probably will have a quad one type opportunity unless they play uh, West Virginia or um, Oklahoma State in the first first day. If they can somehow sneak into Wednesday and not have to play on yeah. Tuesday, that could, could be a factor as well. So lots of things at play there. But I, I can see the case with those three quad 1A wins for K-State being good, but then there's a lot of bad too. Yeah, nine and nine is probably last team in, first team out kind of territory. Yeah, because and Arnett the, would maybe be in the sixties, which it's like Pitt and Arizona State last year, which it, they were shaking on Selection Sunday. And you also like you don't get a ton of the great wins in the league because you'd have two wins over West Virginia, one over yeah. UCF, and State. one over Oklahoma State too. So it'd, it'd probably be like that team 68, 69, 70. Yeah, it's it. I think it's going to be I think it's going to be tough for them. And and look, I, I think there's also a world where if they just play better, it, they can probably get to that number. And, and stylistically, that helps them, too, where I think the, the margin for them, even if they go to nine and nine in the league, is going to be so tight that you want to be a team that whoever on that selection committee that has actually watched the game and hasn't just watched numbers this year, you want to give them a reason to make the case and say, well, here's why we want this team in here. Like I think having Jerome Tang as your head coach is it, it doesn't hurt your cases on selection Sunday. I think because he was, you know, so wildly popular last year, like this is still a TV product. And as much as they want to say some of this stuff doesn't matter, Crazy how Bryce Hopkins ended up playing Kentucky in the first round last year, and crazy how Trey Young and maybe a not so deserving Oklahoma team got into the NCAA tournament. And you know, I remember like Mo Bamba, Texas was in it. Like they know what they're doing. Uh, Michael Beasley and K State is an 11 seed going to Omaha to face a, a, a team five seeds higher than them. Huh, I wonder. I wonder how that happened. Uh, look, they, there are favors done here if if you br- if you bring something to the table. Mm-hmm. And right now, this K State team they don't bring the resume to the table, but they have to at least prove over the next three four weeks that they can bring the resume a little bit up, and that they can certainly bring a little bit more of entertainment value. They already have it with Jerome Tang. They got to do it with the guys that they have actually on the court uh, who you know win and lose games. Which we're twenty five minutes into this. Let's not be overwhelmingly bad there was one positive this week and it was a pretty giant positive for a lot of people the cats did take down KU on Monday night 75 to 70 another overtime win for K-State uh let's just start there 
fan, you've been watching basketball a little bit longer than us. You've you've coached it. You've done a lot of things with it. How crazy is it for Jerome Tang to be eleven and zero in overtime games? Yeah, I mean it's statistically. I was also going to say you're the numbers guy. So what what is the statistical likelihood and, of that? And you just don't you just don't see it. Um, I mean, two in a row over KU in overtime, beating good teams, and I mean we also beat some bad teams in overtime. Yeah. To, be, to be fair, but Baylor twice in overtime the last two yes. seasons now too. Yeah, I, it's it's a significant thing. Like. And it was, you know, it felt like early in that overtime that maybe this was going to be the one they didn't win. But then, you know, all of a sudden they they make plays. It, it's because it's crazy. You know, we talked about the playmaking ability of the big three. And I, I think I said last week, I thought the big three might need to score 60 to beat KU. And we scored 58 amongst the three of them. So um, we know they can do it. But I also think there's an immense amount of pressure on them to do it every game at this point. Um, but, but yeah, Jerome Tang, something, you know, he, he kind of just said he lets his players go make plays in overtime, which, you know, that's, that's fine. Um, but I, I do also think there's at some point there's a con- an extra confidence factor just because after the momentum of winning all these overtime games probably has to come into the players' heads a little bit as well. So that's a, it's, it's an unusual thing. Um, uh, eventually he probably will lose one, but, um, hopefully it's not until next year. Yeah, I, I've genuinely never seen anything like that before. Yeah, Jimmy, they say that he's gonna win, he's gonna lose one. I don't think he's gonna lose one. Like, there, there's just some sort of like added confidence when the game gets to overtime. Like for for a minute, I thought that we were we were turning towards overtime last night, and I was like, yeah. oh, K State's yeah. gonna win because it's gonna go to OT. <laughs> That's yeah. right. Like you you just assume that yeah. they're gonna win when it gets to overtime, which is crazy. Um, the it's always nice to beat KU, so I mean you can't complain about that. And back to back years at home for the first time since 2014, 2015. Yeah. So you you, you enjoy that. Uh, K State's now I think seven and ten in the last seventeen against KU and Bramlage. So it, it's trending in the right direction, and it's 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 nice because I mean when Mason and I were growing up, K State never beat KU at home. So it's nice that it's like kind of not it's not expected, but you go into the game expecting to at least be close. Well, and also we've now seen in you know the the games have been competitive for a while. Really, the only non competitive game recently was the the COVID year game. But mm-hmm. even like mm-hmm. the bad Bruce teams, twenty 2020 twenty and twenty twenty two, they those were good games, and K State had every chance to win it. Um, so it's, it's a step in the right direction for him. And I, I don't know what it is that has changed because I mean, there were even like, there would be better K state teams than what has gone to the floor against worse KU teams and, and not have a chance at home or, you know, get beat pretty poorly. So they played well in that game and they, they put it together. And I, you know, I was hoping that what K state did in that game would be kind of a continuation the rest of the season where, you had back-to-back offensive games where the big three came through for K-State. Yeah. What they did against KU was they brought the defense back into play that had been missing for a couple of games. And just you didn't get the offensive output in, in Provo. And, and that's that's going to be the thing that kills you is looking at that game. You know, people were talking about, well, BYU's going to start making some threes. I wasn't convinced that they were. Like now, they shot it really bad in the first half, but I – I think 32% for the game ends up being about right because I thought K-State's defense, they forced a lot of those misses last night. And you see even, you know, kind of the dagger that goes in to put BYU up five, that that was less of a good shot and more of just a, I'm a volume guy. I'm going to take this shot mm-hmm. right here. It doesn't matter what happens. Because I, I don't think Mark Pope out of that timeout was saying, that's the shot we want. And he was probably thinking <laughs> as it went up, like, what are we doing? Uh, but... It ended up working out for BYU, and K-State had plenty of opportunities, but they shot it poorly, and they ended up coming up with a lot of turnovers, which have have been a major problem for them. Cam Carter, we talked about it last night, today. He's got problems with the turnovers. It's it's a major issue. Uh, Arthur Kaluma, you know, the offense came around late, but he was slow getting going. I think at one point, K-State had like 39 points in the game, and I was trying to think to myself, how many of those points are actually from the main three guys? Because I didn't feel like it was that many of them 
And you just can't have that if you're K-State. And that's how BYU was able to get ahead of them. BYU also, they won points off turnovers 14 to 5. Uh, that's that's probably the biggest number there. Mm-hmm. And the the other benefit, and we talked about this after the win over KU Drew, but if you look at the three point numbers, Tyler Perry and Cam Carter last night combined for one of 14 from three. And we said after that game that what you got from them, that is pretty much in line with what you need moving forward to win games. Where, you know, if Cam Carter goes three of seven or three of eight in a game from three, or not even that, but is efficient with it, makes his shots when they're there, and Tyler Perry takes them and knocks them down. K-State is going to win a lot of games when that happens, but you need those guys to make shots because nobody else is capable of doing so. You almost feel like you you let one get away from you when Day-Day Ames hits two threes early in that game last night. You got two, two throws in the ocean from somebody that never does it, and nobody else stepped up last night until it was far too far too late. Yeah, you got you to have at least two of the big three being efficient and, and making shots. And, you know, even and even most of the game, Kaluma wasn't, you know, his his stretch really was the last – well, when the yeah. case they went on the run to make it a game was when Kaluma came to play, um, and you got to have more than that. You just can't have that kind of shooting night from Perry, especially one one for nine um, from three. It's just you know, especially coming off the KU game where he's four for ten, and you know you're hoping maybe this is that spark that gets him going. And the frustrating thing is both he and Cam and Kaluma. It's not like BYU's perimeter defense is great. We had wow. lots of open shots that were good looks that we just couldn't make. And if you don't make those, you're going to lose games. It's just that simple. Especially, you know, I just looked it up. Over the last eight games, we're getting beat by seven points per game off of turnovers. So that's tough to overcome. You've got to find, you know, Coach Tang does say, and I've looked up the numbers, K-State, when they get beat on turnovers, when they have a certain percentage, the record is not that much different. So I get that point, but you're also how many easy opportunities you're giving away to score, not just the points off turnovers, but the possession you just lost because it went off Cam's hands out of bounds, or we tried to throw a, a, a lob into Gasson and it went out of bounds. And those those add up as well because you're wasting an opportunity. Even though we don't shoot it and play great offense, one out of three of those, hopefully you're scoring on and you give those up, then you give yourself in trouble. Yeah, the the inability of this team to like just catch the ball sometimes yeah. is amazing. And the they were getting good looks, they weren't knocking them down. But what's also crazy to me is that K State had eight points the first four minutes last night in the first half, and ended the first half with twenty seven points. That, yeah. that that's hard to do. That's that's really bad. Yeah, I the the grabbing the ball thing, that's a that's a real tough one for me to to kind of comprehend because it does seem like it's a problem that a lot of these guys have. It's almost like K-State has a team full of guys that they watched Keontae Johnson last year, but the only good thing they took from his game was his ball handling, which is not very good, and they just said, "Yeah, you it's like maybe Jerome Tang says, be like Keontae too much in practice. You're like, well, <laughs> he kicks it around his ankles quite a bit. He still does it even in the NBA. Uh, it, it's 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 frustrating to watch. And that's why last night, like, that's why Jarrell Colbert doesn't play more than what he does is because he is, next to Cam Carter, one of the bigger perpetrators of not handling the ball when it's right there for him to grab. And he also just isn't very smart or talented on offense where he doesn't have the ability in the touch inside that Will McNair has. And he just doesn't make a lot of good decisions on the flip side. Will McNair is the anti Jarrell Colbert on defense. That is why they both are probably playing the right amount of minutes and why I will continue to give Jerome Tang credit for this season. Like I can, I can be critical of Jerome Tang at times this year because I think it's deserved, and I think he's made missteps, and I think he'd probably admit to that. But overall, I'm going to continue to say it. I think he is doing about as well as he can with this team because at the end of the day, if you know, you're know you supposed to go out and put up a fence, but all you have is like half a hammer and it's just the handle, you're not going to be able to be very successful putting that fence up. 
And I think that he's trying to build a fence with half a hammer right now, and it's the wrong end. Yeah, I, 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 yeah, I think you're right on. And it goes back to the roster limitations and, and being two guys down and, and maybe your freshmen not being as good as you had hoped they would be for the season. I think that's part of it. Um, I also just have to make this point because this is why I don't like plus minus and <laughs> – I'm going to bring it up because we like to use plus minus when we want to make a point about a guy. And then we like to ignore it when we don't, because Will McNair was plus nine yesterday um, and the best plus minus player on the team. So again, um, I think you got to be careful with that stat. So the, you plus minus guys out there, I'm going to throw that out there because everybody's ignoring Will McNair being plus nine yesterday. I haven't heard that brought up once. Uh, I'll also point, I'll point this out about uh, the Colbert, fast break turnover i think i think that goes back to this team doesn't have a great basketball iq arthur kaluma is standing right there why isn't he calling for yeah. the ball yeah i think you're right no like, that's a good point like if if you're playing with guys that don't fully comprehend what's going on uh you know that you need to be if you are the guy that has that skill you need to be aware to go and get it uh marquise noel i mean i think last year you could have had somebody like Desi Sills could have had the ball and Marquise Noel still would have gone and gotten his face and said, give me the ball. You know, like you just need more guys like that, that are aware. And at the end of the day, like there's a reason why analysts on TV say really stupid things. And it's like, Oh, well they played well just because you played doesn't mean you know everything. <laughs> I think that the basketball world would be served better if the players actually watched more basketball than just, you know, tape of themselves and everything. I think there's just a severe lack of understanding and picking up the basketball IQ. And it's this is not just a K-State thing. This is an everybody thing. I mean, Nick Timberlake, I don't think he comprehends how you win basketball games either. We saw that yesterday against with KU and Baylor. So I think that's something that that is a big deal. And this K-State team has struggled with it all year, and it's going to continue to hurt them. You brought up the analysts, and I just got – flashbacks to last night how clueless those guys were and boy that's I, a terrible crew I, I i can't remember how many times a, a ball hit the rim and they're like oh it's a shot clock violation it's like no it's not you could you could hear it hit the rim like you can see it you guys are there they're not stopping the ball they're not stopping play because it's a shot clock violation yeah now, the one play. comment i did like is when i can't remember who it was underneath got fouled in the the other guy was like, I could hear the contact from here. How could they not call that? Yeah, yeah. That, that was the one time I was like, you know, these guys aren't all that bad. Uh, I think it was McNair that got that. Yeah, got hit I think it was. There. Yeah, it, it was Mc, McNair got uh, smacked. And then uh, Perry got the ball wide open at, from three and missed yeah. it. And I was like, yeah. oh, that's how this game is going to go. Yeah. Yeah. And that that's kind of been the uh, another issue for K-State recently is, I mean, Tyler Perry was good against KU, but. Early in that first half, he missed some good looks that you're like, eh, I think a guy with your shooting prowess, at least according to Jerome Tang, should probably make at least one of those and kind of change the game. And last yeah. night, there were those opportunities again for Tyler Perry where it like it looked like he was timid again taking his shot. And I just don't know how that can be the case after what he did against KU. And it looked like he had all the confidence in the world driving into the paint against KU, the most we've ever seen from him this season. And he had none of that. He looked disinterested in trying to score when he got inside last night. Yeah. Like I, I don't want you being reckless about it and just throwing up shots to get swatted by six foot 10 guys, but you've proven you can do this, go out and, yeah. and actually continue to make it happen. Not just when you have the home crowd behind you and you feel like, you know, it's, it's an important moment because you're playing KU do it against the BYUs, do yeah. it against the Oklahoma States, do it against everybody because you're good enough to make it happen. Yeah, and especially in that game where you know BYU is prone to foul. And even though I've always hated it from any other player, Perry's really good at throwing his head back mm -hmm. and getting a foul call two or three times a game. I think at some point you got to just try that. I also noticed, I think it was later in the game after he had missed a shot. And when Perry is missing shots, you can tell because he wears it. Yes. And, yeah. and I think Coach Tang was chewing him out one time near the side, not chewing him out, but getting on him about that kind of body language because that he shows it. And I think it just catches up with the rest of his game and may contribute to 
that ability not to attack inside the paint and such that that we saw a little bit last night too. It, him and Kaluma really wear it when yeah. they're not shooting the ball well. And I, you'd notice it uh, with uh, Perry, and I noticed that that Tang got onto Kaluma at one point yep. for wearing it because uh, there was one point where Kaluma was wearing it on offense and then just didn't guard after yeah. he missed the shot. Yeah. And that's where Tang took him out and kind of laid into him a little bit. Yeah, it's just uh, this this team has just again this all goes back to this team has a lot of traits of an NIT team or even one that doesn't make it there, and we'll we'll see. Like they bought themselves time with the win over KU, but this does feel pretty similar to the 2022 team where there's going to be enough yep. bad losses and oh hey look they got they got one win like there's there's this sliver of a chance. And then they go on like a three game losing streak and lose by five points to good teams. You're like, oh, okay, it's gone again. So we'll see if they can correct it here. But the difference was that that 2022 team had a better roster and better talent on it than what this one does. So it's going to be an uphill battle for Jerome Tang and, and what they face. Uh, and I also think that the teams that they have left to play are better than the teams that that squad had left to play. Whereas, like, yeah, you need to win at Oklahoma State. It's like, okay, so we got to beat like a 16 and 16 team. That seems doable. It wasn't. Uh, you know, Iowa State was fine that season, but it's not like, you know, mm -hmm. they were anything crazy and you, you weren't able to get that at home. So a lot to, to go off of there. All right, uh, let's slide into this. We, we talked about it a lot already, but we, we can give official answers here. Time to play our favorite game. NCAA, NIT, or nothing. Uh I'll I'll start with Drew here. Oh. Where do the Cats play after Put, the Big Twelve tournament? Putting me on the spot two weeks in a row with this game. Yep, I just I I really like seeing what you uh you come up with here. Uh, I I would lean nit, but I say lean because like you pointed out, it, nothing is a possibility. So I I lean nit because I I feel like. Maybe Cincinnati gets into the NCAA tournament. Maybe the NIT takes K State anyway. Mm -hmm. But nothing is also a, a a real scenario if if things don't go well. I, I I'm in IT again. I I think Cincinnati probably is in the tournament. Um, they're they're a bubble team, but you know, top forty in the net and four quad one quad two wins right now. So. Um, they got to get a couple more. They they lose a lot of close games, so uh, and they play good defense. Their offense is down with us in the bottom of the league, so they kind of have the same kind of issues. That their their biggest good thing for them is they haven't had the bad losses like we had to Oklahoma, and Nebraska. So um, I do think because of that, I think with ten teams getting in the turn in the tournament for the Big Twelve, I think that will happen. I think UCF and K State will be at the NIT selections um if if k-state doesn't do what we need to do which i think is get at least one more road win win all the home games or win all the home games and win at least one in the kansas city sounds like a 47 42 final uh k-state cincinnati it could be yeah that could definitely be a game first to 50 type game <laughs> yeah cincinnati's worst loss this year is is at west virginia by four but everything else, it's, you know, at Xavier, who's playing better as of late. They lost to Dayton, and then they've lost Big 12 games to ranked opponents outside of the West Virginia game. And they've got a favorable home schedule left to where they're probably going to get at least three more wins, maybe even four, because they play Iowa State uh, on Tuesday at home. Mm -hmm. So maybe they could get that. That would be a big boost. So they're looking at being at least an 18-win team and maybe better than that. Um, cause you know, they also have road trips to TCU and Oklahoma and UCF games that they can win. So I think Cincinnati, while they're hovering around that, just barely in thing right now, they have a schedule left that would make you say, Oh, they're going to go up with it. I think, you know, Monday night after the way K-State played, and I know everybody thinks that I'm really pessimistic and negative and I'm not a K-State <laughs> fan and all this other stuff. I felt like, you know, I put some faith back into this team and I thought, Okay, I think this is the turning point here. I think this can be an NCAA tournament team. I think they can they're gonna find their way. 
And I know that I said like, hey, whatever the outcome is it, it, in Provo is not going to tell us anything new about this K-State team, especially if they lost. Maybe if they won, we say, hey, look, this is a thing. But at the end of the day, what we got out of it was just confirmation that what they did against KU is is one of the things this team can do, but it's not who they are. Uh, they, I said it last night, and I'll say it again. They are, they are Jekyll and Hyde here, where you don't know which one you're going to get on a given night, and one of them is an NCAA tournament team. The other is an NIT bubble team. And mm-hmm. I just think too many times – this team is going to show up, and in the in the Big 12, you can't be that fringe team that hovers back and forth. You might be able to get away with it in the Pac-12. K-State was in the Pac-12. This team, they might look like the bells of the ball with the way <laughs> things are going. They're not. They're in the Big 12, and you're going to play a lot of good teams and a lot of them left on the road and teams that are capable of coming to Manhattan and beating you. So I think K-State's an NIT team right now, uh, and I, I trust Fan that he thinks Cincinnati's going to get in. So. As long as that happens, K State's in. Uh, I don't think they're disastrous enough that somehow West Virginia passes them in the net. That'd be impressive, though, if they did. <laughs> but I think we're probably watching K State in the NIT. And even if they they aren't one of the top two non NCAA teams from the Big Twelve in net, they're fighting for like twenty spots. I feel like yeah. a Big Twelve team would probably get a bone tossed to them. So, and then you know some random third grader out there can go have his Mason both Vermont moment where that's the best game of his life that he's ever been to uh, for a while. And then you grow up and you're like, yeah, I don't know. I guess the wins over KU and Kentucky that I've seen in per- person probably top that one, but uh, I'll never forget Sergio Felli and the boys getting the job done against the Catamounts. So. Hey, I, I had the moment of Skia Jones scoring 62 points when I was in college. So I mean, that's at least awesome. And yeah, uh, you, you saw saying, like the, you know, the cool. single game scoring record. <laughs> I saw like a you know a game where teams couldn't make free throws and K State was trying to claw their way to a win against an America East team. So that was that I was at that that was a fun game. I, that was an enjoyable game though, Mason. Yeah, I, I mean, think I'll, I mean I, I think it's the first time in my life as a as a sports fan that like I felt what like true nerves were in that moment because I was like <laughs> I remember saying to my dad I was like my legs are shaking right now. So plus that was. Cardi- after- and Cartier Martin fouled out, so I remember that. was after that. seven straight years of no postseason for K-State, too. So Yeah. That, and, that helped. That's, and I like I remember I wasn't like on pins and needles in, in 2007, like, oh, are they going to get in the NCAA tournament? I wasn't to like that full stage yet. I mean, I was aware of it. But like I can remember my dad being pretty bummed w- watching it. And Texas Tech got in in 07, right? Yeah. And they were, they were yeah. pretty comparable. Yeah, that's the one I remember is – when he saw Texas Tech flash up, there's like, yep, that's not happening. So, uh, yeah, I, you know, I hope a lot of kids out there they don't don't have to be that sad as a child. <laughs> but it gets better. It got a lot better, I guess, over the next couple I'd of years. Say, it, it, it got better. Like we grew up in like the rough era of basketball. Like it, it, it was horrible. Like when we were like kindergarten through third grade and then that's that's when it really flips yeah i mean i uh, let's i'm just thinking about it like if if things are like a couple years off there's a chance i don't even care about basketball i'm like basketball (laughs) what's the what's the point of that sport you know if i if k-state starts getting good when i'm like 14 who who cares i've already developed enough of this they at least you know salvage my childhood where there's a lot of nostalgia there but i probably would have loved them anyways i mean i love mike sweeney and the royals and they suck (laughs) so that's okay hey i my first year of college was Dane Altman's last year, NIT Final Four. And then Tom Asbury, Jim Mulridge for the next 12 years. So I feel you. That's tough. That is tough. Yeah. I, I, I guess I can deal with, you know, Bruce missing the tournament five times and may, maybe Tang missing it once. I guess I can get over that and, and feel a little bit better there. It is funny, though, and, and we'll, we'll get into some, you know, one final serious thing about K-State basketball and then be done for today. But it's funny to think about how quickly or weird things turn around in sports like that because, I mean, I remember coming to K-State my freshman year, so 2016, and I was saying to myself, you know, there's a real chance by the time that I'm I'm either graduated from here or before that, K-State has a new football and basketball coach than who they started, you know, with when I got here. And then at one point it flipped and I was like, okay, actually, uh, Bill is going to be here 
through my college years and and Bruce is going to be the one that gets the can. And then, you know, things quickly turned on Bill Snyder there uh, with with how things went in 2018 and Bruce made it through. So, you know, things can things can flip around pretty quickly. And uh, fortunately, they did when I was at K-State, not for when Fan was there. He was <laughs> he was like the the NFL team that's like, yeah, hey, kind of like the like I would say what Washington is right now. You know, it's like, well, it's a rebuilding year and you've been rebuilding for the last 12 years. So. <laughs> yes. One of these times you'll get it right. All right. Last thing today. Uh, K-State has this full week off and then TCU comes to Bramlage next Saturday. We'll probably be in the same boat talking about it as if K-State wins on Saturday against TCU. We're like, huh, NCAA tournament? Yeah. Possibly. <laughs> it could happen. Uh, what do we expect for the game next weekend out of K-State? And how – I mean, what what do we think this week of buildup is where there aren't any games and they can focus on maybe some things other than just who you're playing and getting ready for another game? What – what should be the target for them? Well, I mean, definitely a must-win game, right? At home, TCU. I mean, you got to win that one. Um, TCU. I mean, you would hope maybe you get one of those weeks where you get a break, but TCU plays Monday, so they're going to get a pretty good week, pretty full week off too. So you're going to have two pretty fresh teams. Um, Although K-State's only played one – well, I've played one game in almost two weeks, basically, with the Monday night game versus KU. So, hopefully, I mean, I just want to see them play a good first half for once. <laughs> for You know, we haven't played a good first half offensively for nearly a week. You're, you're a little scared because TCU's game is forcing turnovers, and I think they lead the country or, um, or in the top three or four in fast break points which is kind of a scary situation for a K-State team that turns it over a lot and turns live ball turnovers a lot lately and has been outscored by seven points on per points off turnovers in the last eight games. So there's some not good things looking, looking you in the face there, but, you know, TCU has been one of the most up and down teams in the league. I think pretty competitive in most games, but probably losing some games you would think they shouldn't. So, um, it's another opportunity for K-State to get back to 500 in the league and, and keep moving toward that 9-9 and nine mark minimum. So um, it's it's going to be weird. to It's it's always weird to have the week off in basketball, I think. Because yeah. you, get, you get so used to the two games a week deal, and now you're just watching everybody else play. Well, what do you guys think Fort A. State's doing? <laughs> No, I actually, I probably don't want this team to attempt that because they could play bad enough to lose the Fort Hay State this year. Way too soon. <laughs> yeah, too soon, man. Uh, just every home game from here on out is a must win. I, I, I don't love the matchup. I, I don't think that TCU is a good offense at all when they get into the half court, but they're yeah. such a good fast break team that that scares me, especially because K-State at times has struggled to get back on defense all season. So you you worry about that. And you, that goes with what you guys talked about with missing shots earlier and, and wearing it. Like, yeah, you can't you wear out it. And don't get back. You can't do that against TCU. I mean, there are times where Tyler Perry, and you have to do this anyways, but he has to late break out into a, like a full sprint to get back on defense because he's, you know, kind of sulking after missing a shot. Yeah, you, you can't wear a shot that you miss against TCU. Um, like Fan said, I would like to see some kind of competent offense in the first half of a game. Or, or, and I'll throw this out there as a bold and controversial take, maybe even winning at halftime. Mm. <laughs> that I feel like that hasn't happened in a long time either. It's been a while. <laughs> like... <laughs> I, I do not remember the last time K-State had the lead at halftime in a game. Mm, uh, yeah, I mean, I'd have it, to go back and, and, and look to tell myself. Uh, I, I, I genuinely think that my guess right now, if you were forcing it to guess, it would be Texas Tech. I believe you're right. <laughs> yep, yep, that would be correct, which uh, I don't was, know if we're aware. That That's was, game number three of Big 12 play. <laughs> yeah, and we're up 11. Because we went on a twenty-three to nothing run. 
So a, a, a bold and controversial statement from me. I would like K-State to maybe even be leading at halftime Saturday. That's probably a good start. Uh, <laughs> just going in there and seeing uh, maybe if you can you can win the first 20 minutes instead of <laughs> like ideally you you're winning after 40 minutes, but a good start would be winning after 20. I, I think this is going to be I, I'll be interested to just see how K-State responds on Saturday, but I'm not holding my breath because so many times we thought, hey, mm-hmm. this is the time to wake up and half the time this team does it and the other half of the time this team doesn't do it and i just really I, I don't think that you can keep playing like that so they have to wake up the rest of the season you there are no more times to take a nap if you're k-state and we'll see if they can uh actually go out and do that so all right that'll that'll close up shop on uh the the k-state stuff uh last thing before we get out i saw this from uh, one of the pro football focus guys I think it'd be interesting so on super bowl sunday what is the first Super Bowl that you actually like can remember certain things about it where, you know, you may be aware of like who played, you know, when you were five years old, but you may not have any recollection of it. Uh, because I, I think I, I tell people for me, and this ties back into K-State and the NIT against Vermont, um, my sports memories like strong, they probably start around 2007. So like I can, Tell you who played in the Final Four, who played in the World Series, who played in the Super Bowl. I love K State, Vermont, my game <laughs> right there. Uh, so the the Colts Bears Super Bowl, Super Bowl Forty One, is the first one that I can remember things from and actually remember watching and and enjoying and taking in. So where where would that be for you guys? Drew and I are probably pretty close to similar. On that. <laughs> As I say, we're we're pretty close to similar. So we can let fans start. Yeah, I I think probably I have the one I distinctly remember is the Bears over New England Patriots that and you know par, partially a little bit because New England's quarterback was a K Stater, um, so uh, that one comes to mind. Do you have I've, any hot takes about that? I know that I know it's pretty divisive about you know Ring of Honor guys and what they did in the NFL versus at K State. I will say unequivocally it should not be in K State's Ring of Honor. Um, I, I get it. I get, at, at the time we put those together, that was one of the bright spots of K State football. I, I did laugh earlier this week. Uh, the the Fox College Football page posted out uh, these colleges have an NFL MVP and there's the Power Cat there. So yeah, you know, yeah. But I, but I, I do have some memories. I, th- I think the first one I probably do remember was the Raiders and beating the Redskins in uh, nineteen eighty four. All right. So Mason is a little bit older than I am. So my first Super Bowl that I really remember was uh the, actually the year after Mason's. Oh yeah. And it's uh the the Giants being the undefeated Patriots because I I, I remember how like my dad was really trying to build up like the history of the Patriots, like being undefeated. And I was like, like the, and about the 72 dolphins. And I'm like, okay, like the Patriots undefeated, like, and you're like, I'm nine years old. This must happen. Like every so often, like this is a common occurrence. Like if it's already happening, it's like, it it was a, it was a crazy game. Like I I remember the David Tyree catch pretty well. And then Mm -hmm. uh, this kind of started like a, the next Super Bowl, I also remember pretty well the the Steelers Cardinals one. The the James Harrison pick six is yeah. uh, probably the most iconic play from my mm-hmm. childhood in the Super Bowl that I remember. Uh, here's another odd question. I mean, we, we've been a lot, we've been around. We remember these games now. Uh, how many times do you think that you have been? cheering for either the winner or the loser of the Super Bowl because so Drew brings up those games like the Giants Patriots even as much as I was you know at that time uh probably nine ten years old morning Eli Manning beating the one seed Cowboys that season uh when they went on to win the Super Bowl I think already then I was probably firmly in the like anti-Patriots boat and that was before you know things really got cooking uh pretty hot uh (laughs) But like, so that, that worked out, but that next year, like I was vividly pulling for Kurt Warner and the Cardinals. Oh, I think it's just because you, know, you throw an old guy out there that shouldn't be doing that still. I'm pro- I'm going to have a soft spot for him. Really? I it, mean, 
any anybody in that position. I see I see somebody sitting by themselves at like McDonald's. I'm like, I feel bad for that guy. Even if he's having the time of his life, I'm like, man, you know, I want something good to happen for him. That's how I felt about Kurt Warner, who was probably only like 36 in that game. No, we all, we all just were rooting for Kurt Warner because we knew that Cade was would eventually get to K State. Sure. That that the oh god, winners in the Super Bowl that I can remember. I remember really well rooting for the Saints to beat the Colts. Like I I hated that Colts team for like no reason at all. <laughs> that seems that does seem like a weird one to hate the the Colts, but I guess maybe people have strong feelings about Peyton Manning. Yeah. I, I think for me, like when I was younger, probably high school, college, I kind of rooted. I mean, Dallas was winning Super Bowls and I was a Cowboys fan, so that helped. <laughs> and then I I kind of rooted for NFC teams for a while, except for San Francisco because I hated them. <laughs> and I really didn't like Man, Washington. That, you're like a true K-State fan right there. Yeah, go Big 12, except for KU. Screw yes. those guys. Well, and I didn't I didn't root for Washington Redskins either because that, that was kind of the Cowboys' rival. Well, you're an early Florida. adopter of that they might be offensive to people. <laughs> yes. yes. You pre-canceled but, them before everybody else did. But I, but I would agree with you, like Kurt – the the stories, some of the stories you liked. Kurt Warner was a fun one. Um, I I always liked uh, the, both Mannings. I kind of like. I didn't like them a lot, but I liked them enough that I rooted for them in Super Bowls. Um, I I was probably kind of anti New England as well, just because of the the dynasty type thing. Um, so those kind of stick out. I I've I always rooted against the Steelers because. The Cowboy Steelers kind of had a rivalry going back to the 70s. So um, some of those. Um, and then, you know, you like you you always – I always remember that Seattle throwing the interception at the goal line. <laughs> that one was – because I was really – I wanted them to win that game because I definitely didn't want New England to win it. So those yeah. are a few that kind of stand out. Seahawks Broncos, I felt very vindicated when the Seahawks beat them by like a 1,000. I, I am with you on that. I was <laughs> – yeah. I was very much in like the Seahawks are are legit here. Uh so and maybe that has something to do with being in Kansas. So you have more rogue Broncos fans than yeah. anywhere else. So you you, yeah. you hear a little bit more about that. But I I was also in that boat where I was like, I, I think I think the Seahawks are the better team. So I also think it's fun when uh you you know, when nobody ever likes to go back and look at when they're wrong about something, but when you you feel like Hey, I kind of got an idea on what's going to going to go on here, and it happens, and it comes through for you. Uh, like I, I remember just thinking in that 07, or I guess it was the 08 year was when it got played, but 07 season when the the Patriots and Giants played. It's like ah, but the Giants played them close week 17. You know yeah. that was tight. Yeah. They tried them there. They're going to get that second chance, and then it happened. Or uh, I always go to uh, the 2011 NBA Finals. The Mavs swept the Heat. They only played two times in the regular season, but they swept, you know, the first year of the big three Heat. And I was like, I think the Mavs can do it. And they ended up pulling through. And then my crowning achievement last year is hitting a Eagles halftime leader, Chiefs game winner bet. <laughs> so uh, that those are probably the three that stick out to me. Where I was like, I got the edge here. I'm really smart, but I got the I, edge. Not, I there's been plenty of my t- times in my life that I have not had the edge. So. Uh, well, that makes the when you actually hit the ones that that makes it even better because you you remember the ones that you got right, the ones that you didn't get, the ones that you got wrong, and you're just like, eh, that happened. Took a shot in the dark. Yeah. yeah. I I will say I'm looking at it now. If you're the Patriots or the Broncos, I don't think I've ever pulled for you in the Super Bowl. <laughs> I I do remember that. I I was really wanting the Panthers to to win that game. Maybe I just yeah. want a competitive game. And I think that's also what this comes down to is mm-hmm. probably if you got behind early in the game, it feels like I, I cheered for you because I, I don't want to watch a blowout take place, yeah. you know, unless it's tonight. I do want to see the Chiefs blow out the 49ers. So uh, <laughs> yes. I, would, I would very much enjoy that. I'll be insufferable. I might drive to Ames tomorrow and celebrate. <laughs> Yeah, the Chiefs yeah. win tonight. Yeah, I was just gonna say I should not dislike the 49ers this much just because Brock Purdy Purdy is their quarterback. But <laughs> it's it's really not even just him, but it, and honestly, it's not even Brock Purdy's fault. Like it's the it's the people that are very much on the like, oh my gosh, he's he's awesome. Like this guy, <laughs> we could chill out. Like you know, yeah, he's yeah. a fine player. He can do things, but 
I would love to see Patrick Mahomes and Brock Purdy flip situations this year. If Patrick Mahomes play for the 49ers, we are probably talking about them trying to be the first undefeated team since the Dolphins tonight. Because yeah. Patrick Mahomes with those weapons would be incredible. Yeah. And Brock Purdy, if he had those interception creators like Mahomes has, he'd look like <laughs> Iowa State Brock Purdy. So <laughs> I I just you, uh, you didn't enjoy the the montage that Iowa State did for Brock this morning. I didn't even watch it. I I, I knew that I, I scrolled it. right by Drew. I can't believe you watched it. I was that was not that would not have been good for me, you know. It's it's like when people say, "How can you how can you get cyberbullied? You can just log off." I just logged off there. I was like, <laughs> "I'm not gonna let Iowa State and Brock Purdy haunt me this early in the day. They're not gonna they're not gonna do this to me." So, well, if if Felix gets a sack on Brock Purdy, are you gonna use that as a as some some tools? Man, I I might. I might donate NIL to Iowa State and Felix's <laughs> name if that happens. I, I don't know. I don't know how I would celebrate the moment, but there'd be something that would happen. So I, uh, I do. I would like to see the 49ers get trounced tonight, which is odd because, uh, well, I didn't cheer for them when the Chiefs played in the last time, but that was a game. 49ers against Ravens. I was all about the 49ers in that game. Uh, no, I rooted for the Ravens. I, I like Joe Flacco for some reason. Mm -hmm. I've I've just always I'm not like a big like I love Harbaugh guy, but uh, he the way he gets tre got treated by people for a long time once he took the Niners job and then the Michigan job was like oh he's trash get rid of him it's like ah, I think he's a pretty good coach like so yeah. I've always had that going for him it's why like even as much as Mahomes continues to win and his family is annoying as hell I I don't think I'll ever stop pulling hard for Patrick Mahomes and I don't even care about the general success of the Chiefs but the amount of times that people just want to try and find somebody else that's better than him and like discount what he all these other things like that guy is the best out there and might be the best there's ever been like I want Patrick Mahomes to continue to go out there and show up so the people that try and tell me that Josh Allen or Joe Burrow or whoever else is better uh Patrick Mahomes is the second best quarterback in the NFL and it's undisputed right behind Dak Prescott. So, that'll do it for us. For Case, you want to score fan, Drew Galloway. I am Mason Voth. Go Chiefs. Just kick the crap out of Brock Purdy and that Cyclone. We'll see how it goes. Shout out to Felix Anya, DK Uzama, and uh, Echo Boyda, who will be Super Bowl champs this evening.